Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, George Carniadakis, who is a professor of applied mathematics at Brown University. He is very well known for his seminal work on physics guided machine learning. In particular, his paper, Physics Informed Neural Networks, um, is one of those uh, works that I just referred to. He is a fellow of the AAAS, SIAM, and has received numerous prestigious awards for his work, including the, A the IAM ACM Prize on Computational Science in 2021 and the Alexander von Humboldt Award in 2017. So it's yours, Professor uh, Karniadakis. Thank you very much, Michael. Can you see my, uh, my screen? Uh, yes, it's not uh, maximized, but we can see it. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So um, I, this is now maximized. I, I hope you can see my screen and you can hear me. Um, so today I want to talk about, let me start by, by referring to the, those three ways of, of doing computational science and, uh, and engineering, where the, on the left I have the, what we've been doing for, for a very long time, which is sort of more the academic side, while the case where we deal with data in the middle one where we have some physics uh, and then uh, no physics at all, I will, I will basically focus on that. And correspondingly, I will talk about physics informed neural networks uh, for the case we have some physics and then um, operate, which would uh, correspond to function approximation, regression at the level of a function. And then with DepotNet, we go to a higher level of abstraction, namely operator regression for um, identify black, uh, uh, black box systems or, or, or uh, um, new laws and so on. Um, let me say that pins, because of their simplicity, I think, have been a, a huge success in industry. And because uh, uh, the uh, so NVIDIA and ANSYS, Cummings, and many other companies I work with, and I never work with anyone in my life, actually, except for the last few years, is because they adopted pins. In, um, and, and they make products out of it, they get answers, they get, uh, um, they do parameter estimation online in real time and so on. So I'm not gonna show you a lot of cases for the first part, the pins, but I really want to, to share with you what is a pin first of all. So we are on this first page and then just show you one application. So a pin, a physics informed neural network is a composite neural network where this left part here is a standard neural network associated with supervised learning, some data that you have, uh, and then you're trying to find through, through the mismatch, you backprop, and you find the connections. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data, as we know, in science and engineering, but we have some physical laws. Here, for example, I pretend that I'm solving a solid mechanics problem, and so this would be some conservation equations that we have to satisfy, and that will give rise to the second term in... Um, uh, in, in um, the loss function, which of course can be used not to constrain, people use the word constrain, which I don't like it at all, but to inform because, uh, to inform the neural network, because with this, what we do is we actually produce at a lots of points in the space time domain, uh, we produce more data so that uh, although it's uh, unsupervised learning that part, so we have the supervised learning, the data, the unsupervised learning, which looks like supervised, learning because we have uh, data produced by the conservation laws. Now, the reason this is very simple is because the, we use the same technology for automatic differentiation that is used in the back propagation here. We use the same automatic differentiation to deal with all the governing differential uh, operators in the governing laws of the equation. So, so basically the codes are simple, the concepts are very simple, um, of course, there's no theoretical, there's no great theoretical uh, backing yet, uh, although the approximation theory is, is advancing. I will not talk about that, but I will instead show you a real application. And this is an application that uh, comes from um, uh, the Air Force. This is uh, characterizing a surface track, a crack in a gas turbine uh, blade made of aluminum alloy. And what you see here, it's very hard to see, but if you pay attention, you will see there's a very tiny crack right there. And then and there's an ultrasound that will hit that and there will be some reflections. Now, you don't know, of course, the orientation of the crack. 
Uh, so you have to try different angles. And uh, as I said, these are real data. So the only thing that you know is ultrasound. So this was a, um, a hackathon problem by DARPA last year. And there was about uh, a dozen teams trying to tackle this problem. And uh, I have to say that uh, our team uh, was the only one uh, that, um, that solved this problem. And, and, and the other 11 teams, they were complaining that there was basically not enough data. Turns out that we only use 10% of the data, not the 100% of the data, because we use the physics. And the physics here, uh, you come up with a model. The physics is basically propagation of sound through this material, which now is inhomogeneous because of this surface crack, this um, inhomogeneity. So the model, and that's where you need to, to sort of still do some uh, 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 modeling, a uh, physical modeling. The modeling will come in through a sound speed, which will now depend on X and Y. If the material is homogeneous, it's a constant, but now you solve a wave equation with um, a, a speed of sound that you don't know. So, so to this end, we, uh, in addition to the pin, this will be the pin that encodes this equation. Now on the bottom, we also have a new neural network, namely CXY with different parameters theta. By identifying these parameters now theta, let's say of C, we would know C of X and Y. So again, we train the uh, network only using the acoustic wave equation plus uh, this ultrasound data, which of course is very noisy. This is real data, all, all real data are noisy. Uh, and so here I summarize the residual has to be zero here. This is what we penalize in the loss function. And what you see here on the left is the real data, uh, the video, and here on the right is the reconstruction of the signal, the diffraction signal from this wave propagation. So you see here that we don't need to have boundary conditions because we don't know them. We don't need to know anything else. In fact, the materials properties would come in through the C, the, uh, the function of, uh, of uh, speed of sound, which after we obtain this second neural network, CFXY, the zero contour is exactly the one that will give us the, where the, the orientation and the size, the precise um, location of the crack. So it's a very useful technique. We apply now this to, to other problems in microstructure. Now, how did we get to this one? Was it just a standard uh, uh, fully connect neural network? The answer is yes, with a little bit of a modification, we've been very active in developing adaptive activation functions. It turns out that you can parameterize your activation function so that uh, like, like in this case, it's a more general framework that we have, we call the Kronecker neural network that will appear in neural computing. You can see here, we make this, uh, every neuron will fire at its own rate. Let's say it's an, uh, it will have its own activation function. And in fact, these activation functions have parameters which are trainable. Um, one specific manifestation of this is when we superimpose, let's say on the hyperbolic tangent, we superimpose this sinusoidal fluctuations uh, so this, this function, for example, will be uh, some signs with different frequencies. However, the frequency and the amplitude will be a trainable parameter that will be found just like we find the weights and the biases. And you visualize this through the network, you can see what the data do. The data change from one layer to the other, change this adaptive activation function. And as I said, every neuron fires at its own activation function. And that I think is key to some of the multi-scale problems that we have to deal with in science and engineering. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about other pins. We have all sorts of pins for uh, scientific computing, all types of, of uh, um, so, so the knowledge that we have in finite elements, in spectral methods, in fractional PDs and so on, uh, uh, domain decomposition in fact, which will make all these methods fast especially for multi-physics problems. All can be very handy here, but I don't have um, time to talk about it. Uh, uh, we have a SIAM review paper. You can see here, which is sort of a tutorial of this library. The library is called DeepXDE. X stands for any ODE or PD, or in fact, integral, Volterra, or fractional PD, and so on. And there's also a geometry module and so on. It has been downloaded. It was all free. All our codes are free. It has been downloaded more than 200,000 times from, from GitHub. Now, let me talk about the second part where I want to discuss this higher level of abstraction. And as you know, autonomy is a real problem. 
and there has not been a lot of success despite if you go back five years you will see there was very triumphant uh, declarations of of uh, autonomy and so on but we haven't seen autonomy and this is a destroyer by u.s navy going through the north atlantic real situation and this simulation can be done by a patient P mit student who is working with me it takes about one week to do one of the simulations so obviously the, can, uh, the standard methods cannot be used like cfd uh, for real-time uh, computations that we need for um predicting, let's say, the motion of the vessel in this uh, uh, extreme uh, sea state. This is sea state eight. If you're sailing, you know what sea state eight means. You're not supposed to be out there. So uh, obviously, the, the excitation of the vessel is stochastic. So we have to, um, to um, and we have to predict in real time, we have to predict the motions of this. It's a very complex process of flow structure interaction uh, with uh, open surfaces. So, so I was wondering, I was teaching a class and I was wondering some time ago, like four or five years ago, I was wondering if there's actually a universal approximation theorem for functionals, just like we have the say Pengo theorem uh, for functions. And indeed this work, this great work, this jewel of approximation analysis by Chen and Chen from, university, from Fudan University in Shanghai shows that if you have a continuous one-dimensional function or actually a continuous multi-dimensional function, uh, there is a very simple neural network that can approximate uh, uh, this uh, functional, just like uh, the function approximation. Um, so uh, it, in, in fact, with a single hidden layer, this is, remember this is the early nineties. So, so having this knowledge, of course, you can now get off the shelf. For example, you can do an LSTM or you can use a sequence to sequence any of these um, uh, neural networks that have been developed uh, by Google and others. So, so the input here will be some stochastic excitation of the, uh, of, the, of the waves of the specific ocean you're looking at. Every ocean has its own spectrum. So one excitation, another excitation, maybe let's say 100 excitation states, 1,000 and so on. And then you record, this is supervised learning. Now you record, let's say, the three more significant degrees of freedom, which are, you can see this, the, the response is stochastic. Remember, CFD can give you this, but, but it takes about a week. So it turns out after you train this, indeed, you can approximate the functional with very high accuracy. And here I show you on the left one response, on the right a second response with uh, three degrees of freedom. Underneath, you can see the CFD, which takes about one week. This takes about 0.1. Uh, seconds or 0.01 second actually on a laptop on a, with a GPU. So, so again, this is just a verification that we can do functionals, but more importantly, we can actually do nonlinear operators. We can regress nonlinear operators. So I was thinking, can we do all the math, for example, these are, will be explicit operators um, in calculus, in fractional calculus, uh, PDEs and ODEs and so on. But we can also uh, approximate Nonlinear systems, black box systems that we don't even know how to write the governing laws. So this is a work that uh, we did with DeepoNet, Deep Operate, Operator uh, Network uh, for Regression. And again, uh, I was wondering if there is theory behind it. Otherwise, I would like to develop it. But uh, but as I said, as you will see, there was some theory. So, but let me just say what the difference is. So so. Function regression means we go from a finite dimensional to a finite dimensional space. Now we go from an infinite dimensional space to an infinite dimensional space. That obviously it's much more difficult. So, so it's good to have theory. Uh, I already talked about the power of, 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 of being able to learn operators from your network. So going back to Chen and Chen, I discovered this uh, best kept secret and approximation theory, uh, which was uh, developed two years after the functional theorem approximation. And that is now we have an input space, which is a compact space V. G is now a nonlinear continuous operator. Can we approximate it? And that down here, you can see that you can approximate with error epsilon, but now the expression, and again, this is for a single layer, looks a little different. It looks a little different because there are two new networks. There's a network with a branch associated with the input. So the input here, which belongs in space V is U, sample at points J, which we'll call sensors from one to M. And then we have also a trunk, which is associated with the output. And the output is also a continuous space. So now we have a continuous input space with a one neural network, a continuous output space with an, another neural network. There are of course issues of generalization, what kind of architecture would realize that, but we tried different ones. And we found, for example, this one on the right here, 
to be a good architecture in the sense that generalizes well. So the branch network is captured here. The, the trunk network, which is associated with a continuous output trunk here, we cross them here and we get G of U of Y, which is the um, nonlinear operator that we want to, to approximate. Um, now, it turns out that, that, that of a single layer uh, is not very practical. Uh, just like for functional approximation, this is worse for, 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 function, for functional approximation and also op uh, nonlinear operators. You, need, you may have the case of dimensionality at the input. However, we prove a theorem, we extended um, the theorem of Chen and Chen to deep neural networks. So now you can see here, now we replace the single layer with a, 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 a deep neural network. And, and it turns out that we have the proof in this paper that if you use deep neural networks, the curse of dimensionality, you can uh, eliminate, you can beat the curse of dimensionality. And again, that's at the input space. So that means that you don't really need to have, um, uh, to, to break the bank to, to uh, train this, uh, these operators. Uh, so let's recap what we have. We want a U, which is the input, to be mapped to a G of U through this operator G of U. So we'll take a bunch of functions, a bunch of excitations, if you like, loadings and so on. And then we record the output. As I have here on the panel to the right, I try to do a very good job on the input to characterize the input with lots of sensors. I can handle that. Now on the output, the output, of course, is relates to experiments, relates to very expensive um, uh, ab initio, let's say, simulations. So you want to observe the output as to a as few points as possible. And that's, as, as I said, uh, will depend on how deep and expressive the neural network is. Of course, we're interested in the generalization error given unseen data uh, inputs, what happens to this output. The output, again, is a function or, or field. So here's a very simple example of, of a integration. Uh, so basically what we want to do, do is to take this quantity the in integral and and and, uh, and map it to an integral. So can this neural network learn to integrate? Uh, X could be from zero to one, but also you can make it to go from zero to infinity for let's say if you are interested in Laplace transforms. So the setup here is that we have, we take 10,000 functions U of X, okay? And then we observe S at only one point turns out, one training point for the output. And this is what I was telling you before. For each function, I don't need to compute many integrals to, to train this. I just need one integral for each function. Of course, I need to do that 10,000 times. By doing that, you can see now the mean square error here, both the training and the testing error are very close to each other. In fact, in this plot, it's very difficult to see MSC version number of iterations. And here on the right, I have some comparisons with other neural networks. The one that I introduced was basically this that shows a little bit of a gap between the generalization error. So it generalizes well as opposed to standard neural networks. We have tri sequence to sequence LSTM and other operator type neural networks that have been empirically proposed in the literature. So we proposed this in 2019. Last year, there was a really great paper by Caltech, uh, totally different idea, but using basically Fourier transform. Uh, but uh, MIT technology review in, uh, they, they couldn't hide their enthusiasm and they declare this uh, the best neural network, uh, the FNO, the Fourier neural operator. Uh, so they could solve, they say, in Javier Stokes and for any fluid and for example, they could do uh, turbulence. I've been working turbulence for a long time and I know how difficult it is. It is the open problem in classical physics still today, even after this paper. But I wanted to make a comparison between depot net our older neural network with the, the greatest and the latest. So, so here's an example of a very simple problem. Let's take this as an initial condition, a waveform, a square and a um, parabola and advect it linearly in time. Can the neural network and the operator neural networks learn to do that? As you can see here, the standard FNO, the default parameters has a 50% error. We endow the FNO with some memory using an RNN and we were able to, to, to reduce the error to 10, 11%. But the deep net, the standard deep net, the way it is in, on, on deep, in deep XD in the library gives you a 0.3% error for that. Um, it, uh, that doesn't mean that the FNO is not good. For example, here for the earth, an earthquake problem, the accuracy is comparable. There's all, lots of other cases where uh, we get good accuracy. I just want to, to show that this is the beginning in my, in my opinion the, uh, of, of work this, this year, last, next year, on operator regression, lots of people are doing it. Having good theory is really a very practical tool in this case. And I know my colleagues at 
at uh, Caltech are also working on theory, but, but their FNO is not currently backed up by theory. I just want to show you another application of, of the versatility of these neural networks. They can learn fractional operators, fractional derivatives are integral, in, actually derivatives um, guide, uh, sort of disguise as integrals. So they, they, the way we train a fractional derivative, we take all sorts of different functions for which we know the answers. Okay, supervised learning. And here, uh, down here, it shows the, the workflow. Um, the, that, that will be, this will be the input to the branch. Uh, the output to the, the, the output will be, uh, of course, the space, but also the, frag, the, the fractional derivative. You can go from zero to, to two uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a variable, a fractional variable. It has to be one and two, it could be 1.333. Can you learn that? Because that's an expensive opera operation. It turns out, you can learn that here. I have one of these Caputo derivatives. And the reason I show you this example is because I want to emphasize how important is this input space of U, the input space V, the compact space V. Uh, what we used before was actually a non-compact space, namely uh, a Gauss random fields. And we get pretty good accuracy with Gauss random fields, what I showed you earlier. Uh, which, as I said, it violates the theorem, but, but uh, I'll show you later that that's not the, the big problem. The, the problem is expressivity. Uh, one can use a neural network to represent the space V, or you can use, um, here I use, for example, some spectral methods, or you could use wavelets. And if you do that, uh, you gain uh, at least an order or more of accuracy by having, with the same expense, having the, the right, the proper input space. And that's this, what this shows here. Um, so the, the accuracy is very good, it, uh, uh, again, the standard procedure. I want to finish with the following example for multi-scale physics, and I, I call this the tiny bubbles, so tiny bubbles. Now, if you give me a video of tiny bubbles, which becomes bigger and bigger, I can actually use the video because I can replace my branch network with a CNN, and I can give you then, I can train the system to learn how to grow bubbles, okay? But here I don't have the video, so, so I would use for big bubbles, I would use this equation here, known from the time of Rayleigh, uh, how you actually model this. So, so again, I don't use this equation in a physically informed fashion that I did before. I would use it just to generate data, namely the radius of the bubble versus the pressure, the pressure that is between the pressure uh, difference between the ambient and the inside of the bubble. Okay, so that's for the continuum regime when the bubbles are small. So you can see here, this input now will go into the trunk and then time you, so into the branch, sorry, time is the, is the um, in the trunk and, and the output, which will be actually my function in this case, because I just have R, R of T, it uh, will be that. So, so I want to replace this operator with a depot net. Uh, it's a nonlinear, a dissipative equation, so it's not trivial. In fact, you can see here for three different pressures, arbitrary pressures here that I have. Um, you can see that I have, uh, uh, let me see, get the, uh, you can see I have uh, arbitrary pressures here, and then the multi ray dynamics. This is R as a function of time for three different cases. Uh, you have this very fast dynamics, and then you have this slow dynamics. So, so we can we can learn that. But the main problem is that I'm interested in going from the nano regime where I have nano bubbles. So I call them the tiny bubbles, from nano bubbles to bubbles which are um, uh, 10,000 uh, times larger, so I, because the, bu the bubbles grow as I show here. So that's kind of like, a, a, it looks like an academic problem, but it turns out to be a, an, an important problem in biomedicine, in, in the industry, and so on. The difficulty is there is this demarcation line somewhere here, where the continuum regime is here and the stochastic regime is here. You have to deal with fluctuations and so on. Also, how you generate these tiny bubbles you have to use like coarse grain molecular dynamics and so on. So, so the data, the point I'm trying to make is the data here would be very, very different than here. In fact, there is some sort of a, a mismatch here, but, but of course, to have consistent hydrodynamics, you have to have the continuum regime, which will break down, overlap with the stochastic regime. So next, what I show here is that we repeat the same thing. We can basically train this is very expensive because it's, this molecular dynamic simulations takes one day to do one simulation. Um, but if you train, let's say, with hundreds of simulations, the neural network can also learn uh, uh, to uh, deal with, um, with this uh, data, the very noisy data coming from, from uh, molecular coarse-grain molecular dynamic simulations. You can see here how the bubble are, 
a fluctuation, sort of in a breathing mode. Now, another important thing we know that in machine learning in general is normalization, normalization both of the inputs and something that people don't pay attention to normalization of the outputs. If you do real problems, you have to normalize here, especially when you go across four to five regimes in, in time scales, you have to normalize properly. So here we found a proper time constant, both which is valid both for the continuum regime, which is this one here, and the, the, the uh, micro scale, the nano regime, which is here. So the domain that we have now here, this is the initial radius, and this is time, and the domain of training is somewhere here. So again, we'll take data from here, we'll take data from here, from the, from the continuum and the regime, we mix them up, we feed them into the neural network uh, deponents as we show here, and then um, we, we test the results for new, for new initial conditions on the radius knee and arbitrary pressure distributions. As you can see here, this will be the stochastic regime for the nanobubbles. Uh, and we validate with uh, existing solvers. This is the Rayleigh Plessé, and this is actually the interface. And we see right the interface, Rayleigh Plessé, DPD, and the deponent can give you uh, a good result. So this is a sort of a game changer in multi-scale modeling because every time you, you're trying a continuum with a multi -scale, with, a, with a MD, you have to wait for one day for MD for one result. Now the MD result, it is down to 0.01 second. So you can actually, for first time, do time dependent, truly, truly multi scale simulations uh, without um, having to worry too much about uh, handshaking between uh, regimes. So let me finish here by saying that by now, DeepOnet has uh, actually very solid theoretical um, backing from uh, Sid Misra from ETH. I'm part of this uh, long paper, 120 pages. And there are some things that are very important. For example, there's a theoretical work here in this paper that shows that deep ponets can break the curse of dimensionality if you use deep neural networks, as I, I point out, both for the, uh, for, they don't say what type, both for the trunk and the branch. Also, we talked about doing Laplace transform, but even Laplace transform is not in a compact space, in a compact uh, domain. So, so here they, they show that actually, uh, that you can uh, deal with non-compact, in fact, measure, not, not even continuous operators. So you can deal also with discontinuous operators. Uh, there are other important uh, points, for example, uh, that, that the optimal encoding error, and that is a representation of the input, which I, I spoke about earlier, can be done by just uh, random sampling. And the random sampling is almost uh, as uh, optimal. So, so there's, as I said, 120 pages of theory of theorems and uh, and some uh, numerical results. Uh, uh, DeepOnet is sort of in the beginning. There's lots of developments. We're writing a more comprehensive paper now on uh, on doing a, a fair comparison on diverse problems. Sometimes it fails, uh, but there are ways to 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 deal with it. So the most important thing I think was captured by by DeepMind. They wrote a two-page paper about our paper in in Nature uh, Machine Intelligence, saying that the this is, this is which I agree with, is the st first step towards building um, uh, more, uh, sort of higher, higher level abstractions and more scalable universal operators. These operators could be trained by either experimental data, uh, smooth data, noisy data, and so on, uh, prior knowledge, historical data. And I think that's very important because then after you train these operators, you can uh, 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 predict in, in uh, real time. Uh, let me just thank my sponsors, the films, um, the DOE center that I direct, with many partners, and also a recent uh, MURI award. Uh, the emphasis here is not just on, on, on learning, but also meta learning, how you actually make this um, more robust, uh, both uh, at the function level, the pins, but also at the operator level. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Yep. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions, so let's get to them. Um, very interesting talk. Does deep, depot net need to be retrained if initial conditions, boundary conditions, and or equation coefficients are changed? Right, that's a very good question. That is exactly what we try to, uh, to address going from pins to depot net. Uh, so depot net you train for different initial conditions, different boundary conditions. For example, the advection problem I talked about, this, uh, we, the, the, um, uh, it's for different initial conditions. So you have a class, so the input space V now will have a set of all initial conditions. 
that you can think of. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, the richer the space is, the, the, the better the generalization. And in fact, the extrapolation outside the, outside the distribution is. So we have shown that in some of our papers for realistic problems, again, like hypersonics, a project that we do for DARPA and the Department of Defense. So, so that, um, that's a very good point. Uh, there's also a possibility to, to inform, to, to, to have the physics in, inside the deponent during training. And again, that's offline training. Online, uh, you're supposed to know how to deal with all initial conditions, boundary conditions. If you forgot to train it, you have to go back and define another input space and you do it. But yes, the answer is hopefully you don't have to do that. Ah, okay. Uh, next question. Can you please expand on the relative advantages of DepotNet over Caltech uh, uh, Fourier neural operator? Um, Right, so, so uh, th th there's many uh, differences. I wouldn't call it necessarily advantages. I think, uh, I think the FNO is a very accurate in general. Uh, if you have C infinity, just like Fourier series. Fourier series are very, very accurate. You cannot beat them. But the problem, you have a hole in the domain, so co you cannot deal with complex geometries. Also, an another important limitation, I think, is for us, we can have uh, arbitrary inputs, arbitrary outputs. You don't have to match the dimensionality. You don't have, uh, have to, to match the input and the output. You can have one input and 10 outputs. In the FNO, you have to match that. So, so there are probably ways of doing it. In fact, we have uh, extended ourselves, FNO. Uh, but FNO is based on a great idea. It just is limited by some of its components. So, so complex geometry and realistic problems. So noise, we have another case I didn't talk about here where you increase noise in the inputs for, for I, I show it in the table in the stability problem for doing like uh, boundary layers and, and hyper, hypersonic boundary layers. If you put a little bit of a noise, one person noise, the error in FNO is huge actually. You cannot ah. deal with noise. Uh, okay. There's regularizations and so on, but uh, uh, you know, the idea is to, to, to sort of uh, have something that more robust than, than this. But uh, in terms of accuracy for a simple problem, I think the two are equivalent. Okay. Um, another question. Are there opportunities for assimilating real-time data in PIN and related frameworks similar to data assimilation and weather modeling? Yes, very good question. In, it, it depends how you use PINs, uh, but I think the uh, uh, data assimilation, this is uh, a couple of papers we published with the title Deep MNM, M stands for Multiphysics and Multiscale, was basically based on deep onet, deep onet, which are pre-trained. Then when you have a few data points in hypersonics, they say you only have three velocities and two and two temperatures. Okay, great. So, so you assimilate this data in real time, actually. We, we, we show that you have a supervised learning, a, a, big, a big loop, and then inside there you have uh, blocks of deep onets, which are pre-trained. So then you just have new situation. The guy said, okay, now, now I have, the, the Russians are chasing me. I have to go Mach number 13. How do I do that? Well, you have to have at least five measurements to assimilate. So you, so you have to assimilate not in real time, in hypersonic real time. <laughs> and, and yes, it can be done. Uh, again, it depends on the generalization of your deponent. And the more you train offline, the better generalizes outside the distribution. So then you need less data to assimilate. But it is, it, is been, it's, it is being presented as a data simulation in real time, actually. A pin would do it, but it will be slow. Ah, okay. Um, a couple more uh, basic questions. How to represent the function in a data format to be the input of the network? Um, not exactly no, but, but basically you can do an array. You just have it as an array, for example, at the sensors, or, or, or you can uh, represent it through the coefficients, let's say the wavelet coefficients, or you can represent it, the input could actually be itself a neural network. So, mm -hmm. so, so the, the, spa the space V could be a neural network. So then you can uh, have it for different functions or a class of that, like, like that. It is still an open field. It's, um, I think that's where the, um, because the, as I said, the generalization relies a lot on that, as I, I indicated in one case. But I think uh, some some smart representations would be uh, necessary for further advances, especially with high dimensionality. Because yes, we break the case of dimensionality, but how in practice you still need a lot of data. Okay, move on to our next speaker.
Thank you all very much. Uh, let me stop share here. I got to stop share. How do I stop? <laughs> Maybe someone can. Oh, sorry about that. Let me uh, go back to full screen and stop share. I want to stop share here, right? Oh, shoot. My, my the drop down is not coming. Sorry. You're, you're good, Nathan. Oh, my God. Okay. You're going to kill me. Okay, great. All right.